Hello everybody and welcome back to Top 5 Scary. Today we've got an extra special treat for you. It is our Top 5 Horror Movie Monsters Montage. So we've got plenty of movie monsters all packed in, in one place for your viewing pleasure. Enjoy. Azathoth, Nylarthotep, Haster. All scary, no-nonsense monsters from the extended Lovecraft universe. All very capable of ruining everything you've ever loved. And everything you've ever dreamed of loving. They are powerful. Insanely so. So monstrous in influence that it's unlikely any human will fully understand the true scope of their strength. These are terrifying beings that you would not want to come across at any point. Simply seeing them might turn your mind to mush. So instead, we're going to discuss some of the less omnipotent, more strictly strange monsters of the cosmic variety. Sure, the big shots are pretty weird, but in a nameless, faceless kind of way. The ones we'll discuss today are weird, and you can point out exactly why. Not every being from the Cthulhu mythos has to wreak havoc across the world, right? Hello horror heads and welcome back to the scariest channel on YouTube, Top 5 Scary Videos. I'm your horror host Keegan Hughes and today we're counting down the top 5 strangest Lovecraftian monsters. Weird enough that you'll never be able to forget them, so get ready with that brain scrubber. Before we get going, make sure to give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe for more cosmic chaos. Outstanding. Let the weirdness commence. Kicking us off at number 5, we've got Brown Jenkin. Mmm, yeah, that uh... Makes me uncomfortable. Debuting in the dreams in the witch house, this little rat creature thing is just terrible. Imagine running into this down some dark alley. I'd check myself right into the mental hospital. A large, fuzzy, four-legged creature with jagged teeth and a human face, Brown Jenkin is the animal familiar to the witch Keziah Mason. A lovely quote from the story reads, Witnesses said it had long hair and the shape of a rat, but that its sharp-toothed, bearded face was evilly human while its paws were like tiny human hands. It took messages betwixt old Keziah and the devil and was nursed on the witch's blood which it sucked like a vampire. Its voice was a kind of loathsome titter, and it could speak all languages. So it's got a beard, human paw hands, and drinks witch blood like a baby vampire. Got it. It hangs out in the darkness of the witch house, scuttling around and nuzzling folks at odd times. In the same story, young Walter Gilman takes up residence there and begins having nightmares featuring Keziah and Jenkin. As the dreams become more vivid and sacrificial, Walter starts to think they might be real. One night, he couldn't take the visions anymore and killed Keziah during a sacrificial ritual. Without a master, Brown Jenkin was lost. Oh, what was he to do? Oh yeah, burrow his way into Walter's chest and eat his heart while in full view of another town. Delicious. If a heart eating rat man isn't enough to put something on the top 5 strangest list, I don't know what is. Coming in at number 4, Night Gaunts. Another dream beast, these oily xenomorph looking faceless fiends are based on Lovecraft's childhood sleep paralysis demons. If you thought your sleep paralysis demons were bad, imagine hallucinating while having a mind like Howard over here. Oh goodness me. Black humanoid beasts with smooth whale like skin, pointed horns, bat wings, paws, and barbed tails constantly lashing about, these really are the things of nightmares. Quiet as the night, these things never spoke, laughed, or even breathed. In fact, they had no faces at all. Smooth as a baby's bottom up top. The worst thing about them is their method of incapacitating victims. Night gaunts, while striking imposing figures, are no fighters. Instead, they rely on stealth and tickling. Yes, you heard me right, they tickle their victims. After swooping in on an unsuspecting bystander, they will grope and grapple and tickle them in ways to make them uneasy, ashamed, and upset. Their tails often find certain spaces between that most folks would rather remain unfondled. Once thoroughly incapacitated, the gaunts can carry the person up to great heights and drop them, often resulting in death. They're also quite formidable on rooftops or in places with plenty of stairs. Sometimes they can be quite helpful though. In the dream quest of unknown Kadath, they sort of act as the flying monkeys of the story, causing mayhem, but also flying people to where they need to be. It's a love-hate deal with these things, which only makes sense in along with the strangeness ranking. At one point, it was theorized that they served Nyalarthotep, but later it was revealed that they revere Nodens as their lord and master. Watch out though, it has been said that even Earth's gods are afraid of them. Coming at number 3, we've got Shagoths. Shapeshifters without shape. I don't know if that's contradictory or not. Not that it matters, we're talking cosmic horror here. 
Transmutations are pretty standard among Lovecraftian beasts, but these things are unique, okay? They were genetically engineered by the Elder Things to be used as servants and slaves. Their most common application was in underwater construction, which put their gelatinous, almost amoebic forms to good use. Originally, they were created to be mindless drones, but over time, they mutated and developed consciousness. The Shagaths, of course, were not too happy about how they were being treated. Eventually, through hard work and determination, they unionized and got fair compensation and benefits for their labor. Nah, I'm just kidding. They violently rose up and drove their masters to extinction. Way to go, champs. So proud of you. Nowadays, they live out their lives as sentient blobs of gelatinous flesh, rolling around the less visited areas of Earth. Self-shaping, Shagaths are capable of shifting into whatever form it may need. This includes growing new organs and hardening into less than gelatinous substances. Most of the time, they'll remain as rolling bunches of eyes, mouths, and pseudopods. Suction is very important to them after all. In fact, it's how they kill things. They envelop their victims and then generate enough suction force to decapitate. Imagine that, having your head blown off by sheer suction. Stop thinking what you're thinking, like the cold vacuum of space, you freaks. As the Shagaths prefer to chill in the Antarctic and deep in the ocean, it's not uncommon for them to work alongside the deep ones. Just a bunch of unsightly abominations hanging out in the ocean. Goals. Unfortunately, the Shagaths haven't completely escaped subjugation. Another member of the strangest club are known for conducting experiments known as mind grafts that let them telepathically control the goo spheres. And these beasts are known as. Number two, Migo. Quavo, Offset, and Takeoff? They are not. No, these are a race of fungus based aliens. And they are super technologically advanced. I'm talking insane, species altering skill with surgery, biology, chemistry, and mechanics. They can just experiment on stuff until it's totally changed. And boy, do they like messing with humans. These big, pink, crustaceous funguses are covered in fleshy bits with heads full of antenna. They've got large claws and some bat like wings that work a lot better in space than they do on Earth. Plus, they can't be photographed. Their bodies are made up of otherworldly material, and our puny human cameras just can't keep up. Although some of these features might lump them in with vampires, they don't have blood on the mind. Nope. Migo are more interested in human brains, specifically for experimenting. They're known for snagging still living human brains and putting them into brain cylinders for transportation. These tubes can then be attached to external devices to allow it to see, hear, and speak again. However, the brain still functions while inside of the tube, allowing the human thought process to continue while being deprived of any and all senses. Sounds like hell, doesn't it? Some total I have no mouth and I must scream vibe. Here. It appears that Migo worship Nyalarthotep and a couple other outer gods, which may have something to do with their alien moral system. Of course we're going to think they're evil and terrible and weird for stealing our brains, but we just don't understand the inner machinations of their minds. They're doing this to further the development of the universe. Thank you. And lastly at number one, the Hounds of Tendalos. You've heard of Angles, now get ready for Devils. The House of Tindalos can be both. These are extra dimensional predators that will materialize anywhere, anytime, just to get a taste of their time traveling prey. Known to inhabit the angles of time, they like to prey on curved dwellers like us whenever they can. Little is known about their appearance as very few victims survive, but it is said that they have hollow proboscises for draining their prey dry. Like a big living Capri Sun. They also tend to leave behind blue, pus like goo wherever they feed. As angle dwellers, the hounds can appear wherever angles and corners exist. If the angle is sharper than 120 degrees, it's even easier for them to pop out. Usually, their arrival is preceded by smoke pouring out from the corner and then their head popping through. Now, I've been calling them hounds, but that isn't because they resemble canines. In fact, they're less dog like than you're probably imagining. They're labeled as hounds thanks to their behavior, where they will pick up the scent of a man and follow him across all matter of time and space in order to feed. And once they have your scent, it's all over, bucko. It appears the only way to avoid them is to be somewhere devoid of all angles. This can prove to be quite difficult considering the modern world we live in. Man loves his angles. It's in our entrepreneurial blood. So, if you find yourself being sniffed out by a hound of Tindalos, try plastering up curves in every corner of your home. If that proves to be too labor intensive, it's time to retreat to nature. You get to be a hermit for the rest of your days. No sharp angles out there in the woods. Just remember, no cabins, lean-tos, or tents. Lots of degrees in those. And good luck making curved tools. And there you have it. Five weird, wonderful, wobbly abominations from somewhere in the Lovecraft canon. How do you feel after all that? 
Are there any creatures you think are much weirder? Which of the five is your favorite? Make sure you let me know down in the comments. Speaking of comments, let's have a quick look at some of your more mayoral ones from Top 5 Most Disturbing Monster Movie Transformations, Part 3. Evan Allworth says, Wow, so excited to eat my Italian sub lunch after this, lol. Thanks, Keegan. 10 out of 10 as always. Nothing says stomach churning monster transformations like deli meats and hot peppers. Enjoy. Northeast Bass Fishing says, Good job, the beast within is not a werewolf. Paul Clemens turns into a giant flesh-eating cicada. Correct. Good on you looking out. I may have slipped after a long day of script writing. So this is my life says, I wonder if Transformers is considered body horror to toasters. Auto body horror. Maybe. Oh boy, that joke was just... It was way past its Optimus Prime. I don't know if I could Bumblebee any less funny. Good night, folks. I'm here all week. David R says, I'm still disturbed that there is no top five Dante's Inferno tortures. Oh, David, where would we be without you? Keep on fighting the good fight. Who knows what might happen? And Miss Midnight 3, the boss and the legend friendly says, El Firsto. I'm sure you are, Miss Midnight. I'm sure you are. That's all the time we have for today. Before I do a backflip off stage, snapping both my ankles, make sure to give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe for more cosmic content. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Yeah. They are super technology advanced. Nope. Oh, how am I? What, do I? what is English again? I forget. Plus, they can't be photographed. Photographed. Plus, but it is said that they have hollow proboscises. Proboscises. Probus. Proboscises. Big mosquito things. Base fishing says. Base fishing. It's a bass. We have covered a slew of folklore tales from across the globe, however, let's head east today over to India where there are a ton for us to cover to keep you up tonight, or just to serve your brain with a little bit of Indian folklore knowledge. So today on Top 5 Scary Videos I'm going to be counting down our list of the top 5 terrifying monsters from Indian folklore. Before we begin though, be sure to stick around until the end of the video where I'll be responding to some of your comments. And with that, let's jump in. So apologies if my pronunciations are off. Coming in at 5, Garuda. Garuda is a legendary bird or bird-like creature in Hindu, Buddhist and Jain mythology. He is variously the vehicle mount of the Hindu god Vishnu, a dharma protector and astasena in Buddhism, and the yaksha of the Jain Tirthankara Shantinatha. It is described as a kind of bird and a kite-like figure. He is shown either in zoomorphic form or in anthropomorphic form. Garuda is generally a protector with power to swiftly go anywhere, ever watchful and an enemy of the serpent. In Hinduism, Garuda is a divine eagle-like sunbird and the kind of birds. He is said to be a powerful creature in the epics whose wing flapping can stop the spinning of heaven, earth and hell. He is also described to be the vehicle mount of the Hindu god Vishnu as I previously mentioned and typically they are shown together. Garuda's links to Vishnu, the Hindu god who fights injustice and destroys evil in his various avatars to preserve dharma, had made him an iconic symbol of king's duty and power, an insignia of royalty or dharma. His eagle-like form is shown either alone or with Vishnu, signifying divine approval of the power of the state. He is found on the faces of many early Hindu kingdom coins, with this symbolism either as a single-headed bird or a three-headed bird that watches all sides. Throughout the Mahabharata, Garuda is invoked as a symbol of impetuous violent force or speed and of martial prowess. Coming in at 4, Makara. Makara is a legendary sea creature in Hindu mythology. In Hindu astrology, Makara is equivalent to the zodiac sign Capricorn, which is my sign. Makara appears as the Vahana of the river goddess Ganga, Namada, and of the sea god Varuna. Makara are considered guardians of gateways and thresholds, protecting throne rooms as well as entryways to temples. It is the most commonly recurring creature in Hindu and Buddhist temple iconography and also frequently appears as a gargoyle or as a spout attached to a natural spring. It is generally depicted as half terrestrial animal in the frontal part and half aquatic animal in the hind part. Though Makara may take many different forms throughout Hindu culture, in the modern world its form is always related to the marsh crocodile or water monitor. Makara has been depicted typically as half mammal and half fish. In many temples, the depiction is in the form of the half fish or seal with head of an elephant. It is also shown in an anthropomorphic with head and jaws of a crocodile, an elephant trunk with scales of fish, and a peacock tail. Lakshmi sitting on a lotus is also a depiction in which she pulls the tongue of the elephant shaped Makara, is meant to project Lakshmi's image as the goddess of prosperity, wealth, and well being. It represents a necessary state of chaos before the emergence of a new state of order. Coming in at three, Ganda. Barunda. The Ganda Barunda or Barunda is a two-headed bird in Hindu mythology, believed to possess immense magical strength. 
It was the emblem of the erstwhile kingdom of Mysore under the Wadia kings and after India attained independence it was retained to the Mysore state as its emblem. The bird is generally depicted as clutching elephants in its talons and beaks demonstrating its immense strength. In the Chenakashava temple of Balur Kanataka, Anabranda the two faced bird is carved as a scene of chain of destruction in which a deer becomes prey to a big python which in turn is lifted by an elephant. A lion attacks the elephant and the lion itself is devoured by Gandabranda. The Gandabranda was later identified as a physical form displayed by Narasimha, man lion incarnation of Lord Vishnu. After Lord Narasimha had slain the demon Hiranyakashipu, he clung on to his dreadful form. The Devas were even more afraid of Lord Vishnu than they were of the demon. In order to protect the entire creation, Lord Shiva incarnated as Sharaba, a part lion and part bird beast. This further angered Lord Narasimha, who took the form of Lord Gandam Barunda, who fought Sharaba for 18 days and held him between his two beaks and ripped him apart, thus killing him. Coming in at number 2, Ahai of Ritra. Ritra is a Vedic serpent or dragon in Hinduism, the personification of drought and adversary of Indra. Also identified as Asura, Ritra was also known in the Vedas as Ahai. He appears as a dragon blocking the course of the rivers and is heroically slain by Indra. According to the Rig Veda, Ritra kept the waters of the world captive until he was killed by Indra who destroyed all the 99 fortresses of Ritra before liberating the imprisoned rivers. The combat began soon after Indra was born and he had drunk a large volume of Soma at Vashtra's house to empower him before facing Vitra. Vashtra fashioned the thunderbolts for Indra and Vishnu when asked to do so by Indra, made space for the battle by taking the three great strides for which Vishnu became famous. Vritra broke Indra's two jaws during the battle but was then thrown by Indra and in falling crushed fortresses that had already been shattered. Indra became known as Vatranam meaning slayer of Vritra. However the story changes in Puranic and later versions. As told in the narration given to King Yudhishthira in the Mahabharata, Vritra was a demon created by artisan god Fasha to avenge the killing of his son by Indra. Vritra won the battle and swallowed Indra but the other gods forced him to vomit Indra out. The battle continued and Indra was eventually forced to flee. Vishnu and the sages then brokered a truce with Indra swearing that he would not attack Vitra with anything made of metal, wood or stone, nor anything that was dry or wet, or during the day or the night. Indra instead used the foam from the waves of the ocean to kill him at twilight. Sneaky sneaky. And finally coming in at number 1, Sharabar. Sharabar or Sarabar is a part lion and part bird beast in Hindu mythology who, according to Sanskrit literature, is 8 legged and more powerful than a lion or an elephant, possessing the ability to clear a valley in just one jump. In Sanskrit literature, Sharaba is initially described as an animal that roared and scared other animals in the hills and forest areas. In the great epic Mahabharata, this form of Sharaba was defined as a lion slaying monster with eight legs, eyes on the top, living in the forest in which ate raw flesh. It is also mentioned as residing on Mount Karuncha, but not as a monster, but as an ordinary beast along with lions and tigers. Sharaba appears primarily as the incarnation of Lord Shiva, as a name of a monkey king in the epic Ramayana, also as a proper name of heroes and serpent Najas and one of the names of god Vishnu as well as Buddha. In Puranic literature, Sharaba is associated with the god Shiva, who incarnates to subdue fierce manifestations of Vishnu. The man lion form of Vishnu brings about the rivalry between the devotees of Vishnu and those of Shiva. Sharaba is betrayed with two heads, two wings, eight legs of the lion with sharp claws and a long tail. Sharaba is also described as black in colour with four feet downward and four feet uplifted with an enormous body. It also had a long face and nose, nails, eight legs, eight tusks, a cluster of mane and a long tail. It jumped high repeatedly, making a loud cry. Well there we have it, do you guys agree with our list with only monsters that we missed? Leave us all your thoughts and feelings in the comments down below. I apologise once again for my pronunciations, it is a difficult task. Before I go though I just want to respond to a few comments from one of our last videos, Top 5 Scary Irish Urban Legends. Eternal Communism 1974 said, Lucy McPhee, your current outfit is what I will always remember in this life and after. By the way, it also reminds me of my ex-girlfriend in 2018. I've heard a lot about this ex-girlfriend in 2018. She's still dead. Sixy Girl PDX said, not all fingers are good fingers. Lucy 2020. That was an iconic quote by me, I must say. I want that on my gravestone. <laughs> Andy Romero said, I like trains, do you? I like trains too. It's probably my favourite form of transport. I'm hopping on the train. Beezer1225 said thank you for covering Island. I find their urban legends fascinating. As do I. It was very fascinating. And on that note, if you haven't already, be sure to give this video a big thumbs up, subscribe and turn on notifications so you never miss another scary vid. And until next time, see you later. After Lord Narasimha.
Narasimha. After Lord Narasimha had slain the demon Har- uh -huh. I swear to god, editors put this all at the end please. Make this 10 minutes. Hira- Hiranyakashipu. Hiranyakashipu. Hiranyakashipu, who took the form of Lord who fought Sharaba. I'm so sorry. Come in at two. I. Ahai. Ahai? Ahai. Ahai. Or Vrit. Ahai. Vritra. Vritra. Ahai or Vritra? Vritra is a Vit. Vedic. 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 Oh, I hate that. I've been like delaying filming this for so long. For this feat, Indra became known as Vrat. Frahanan. As told in the narration gives As told in the narration given to King Yudit his oh Yudishthira 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 Sharabah 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 as a name of a monkey king in the epic Ramay Ramayana Yana in the epic Ramayana yeah Ram Ramayana Heroes and Serpent Nagas and one God that sounds weird Nah, yeah, yeah, it sounds like I'm saying something. Uh, sounds like. Yeah. It sounds like the N word. Nadjus. Shall I say Nadjus? <laughs> Have you ever been having a conversation with somebody and you remember the shape of something or the sound something made but you can't quite put a name to the description? Or maybe you recall a wicked movie kill but you don't remember where it came from. We've all been there and it sucks. It makes you look like a buffoon too. Thankfully, I'm used to that. It's unfortunate but there are simply too many horror movies for any one person to remember. Sure, if you have a photographic memory and nothing to do but marathon movies all day, you might come close to total movie recall. But the rest of us have books to read and potential love interests to pursue. Which is why I have the pleasure of bringing you some of the less remembered creatures and crawlers from horror movies of days gone by. Hello horror heads and welcome back to the scariest channel on YouTube, Top 5 Scary Videos. I'm your horror host Keegan Hughes and today we're counting down the top 5 forgotten horror movie monsters. So put your nostalgia goggles on and maybe step into a soundproof room lest everyone hear you say, I remember that every time I read off an entry. Before we begin with this countdown, make sure to give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe for more historic hellions. Outrageous. Let's get started. Coming in at number 5, we've got Rawhead Rex from Rawhead Rex. This could have been one of the big 80s horror series if done right. Poor Clive Barker. All he wanted was to adapt his insane vision perfectly to the big screen. This is a sexually charged pagan demigod monster movie written by the Hellraiser creator himself. Funnily enough, Barker has disowned this movie even though he wrote it. The effects and presentation weren't what he imagined, leaving poor Clive sorely disappointed. A remake was in the works for a bit, only to get cancelled thanks to Barker's involvement on a Hellraiser reboot. Can't win them all, I guess. Back to the movie at hand, Rawhead Rex is resurrected and goes on a wicked rampage through the Irish countryside. Plenty of over the top accents inbound. We are treated to 89 minutes of a huge man in a rubbery gorilla suit with a receding hairline and crossed eyes causing mayhem and bedlam. It's lovely. There's something about the monster that just screams so close. If they just figured out a way to make his big wet rubbery maw a little more threatening. If they had just fixed his slightly askew eyes, they were just looking forward instead of in and out. They could have just saved his major reveal until a little bit later, but alas, too little, too late. None of this makes the movie any less fun, mind you. It probably just affected its success at the time, making it easier to forget these days. In the meantime, enjoy Rawhead Rex's campaign through rural Ireland as he desecrates a church, performs baptism by urination, kills a few sons and daughters, explodes some police cars, decapitates some farmers, and of course, bloodies his fangs. All this culminates in a very 80s neon light show featuring some less than fully clothed women, checking all sorts of cheesy horror movie boxes. All that was needed to keep him going was a sequel, and unfortunately that never truly came to fruition. 
Maybe next time, Rex. Coming at number four, It. From It, the terror from beyond space. Although it was considered to be an inspiration to the screenwriter behind Ridley Scott's Alien, this flick never quite took center stage in the same way. We're dropped in on Earth's second mission to Mars, where all sorts of space folks are trying to figure out what happened during the first expedition. Of course, an alien killed the previous crew and is now stowed away on the rescue vessel, ready to manja his next prey. Sure, the alien looks like a man in a rubber suit, but it's a good rubber suit. A really nice rubber suit. This was the 50s, they didn't have the technology or the know-how to create the insane mind-bending stuff from decades in the future. It did have a whole bevy of fantastic traits though. It was impervious to bullets. Grenades, gas, electrocution, and more. It was very well suited to mucking some space folk. Plus, it could tear through metal and slurp all the fluids out of its victims. Apex Predator in space, just like all the movies that came after it would feature. A classic indeed, but without the wow or star power that would make it forever memorable. It doesn't help that it was totally overshadowed by the xenomorph later on, and then by Pennywise the Clown and all of his TV and movie based exploits under the title It. These two pop culture goliaths make it very unlikely that it, the terror from beyond space, will be as fondly remembered as it could be. Oh well, not everyone can be a star. Coming in at number 3, Ghost Pirates from the Fog. It's hard to argue that any Carpenter monster is truly forgotten, but when you're up against the likes of Michael Myers and The Thing, it's easy to get lost in the mix. The Fog is one of Carpenter's earlier efforts, and even with the cast including Jamie Lee Curtis and Adrian Barbeau, it doesn't get all the attention as the others. In the fog, a ghost crew hailing from an infamously sunk leprosy ship returns on the 100th anniversary of their deaths, coinciding with the town's 100th anniversary. You see, Antonio Bay was built with the gold taken from this ship, and the ghosts are not very happy about this. So they must come back for their revenge, and six must die in order for the score to be settled. The ghosts themselves don't have too much in the way of personality or eye popping staying power, but they are definitely incredibly creepy and haunting. This is thanks to Carpenter's evocative and moody directing style, letting their presence slowly creep in like the titular fog. We watch them take down a fishing boat in silhouette and shadow the windows of a truck without alerting anyone to their presence. Soon enough, they spill into the morgue and the radio station and some homes into the church. They can appear from anywhere, as their presence is tied to the fog. And when they appear, they are armed to the teeth. Swords, daggers, hooks, all very classic piratey stuff. However, because it's so classic, so incredibly pirate-like, it's hard to differentiate them from other seafaring skeletons. Even with their single-minded push through the darkness towards revenge, the fog itself hides what might be too much if you want to make a totally memorable horror movie monster. A phenomenal creepy atmospheric film for sure, but definitely a group of movie monsters that often get overlooked. Coming in at number 2 we've got Quetzalcoatl, or Q, the winged serpent. The monster is called Quetzalcoatl, but you can call it Q, that's all you'll have time to say before it gets ya. That's an abridged version of a line from some marketing material when the movie was released. I don't know if that helped or hurt the monster's staying power, but it was an interesting strategy to say the least. We follow a part time crook with dreams of being a jazz pianist as he accidentally discovers the nest of a monster atop the Chrysler building in New York. Specifically, an Aztec winged dragon like lizard. So Q flies around New York City making snacks of city slickers on rooftops. It's like a big sky high buffet for this thing. Honestly, it's a really ambitious idea done pretty cheesily. We're treated to some stop motion animation by Randall William Cook and David Allen. The beast flies around in the air snatching people up and sending showers of blood down upon the pedestrians. Kinda reminds me of old King Kong at a lot of points, probably thanks to the fact that there's a stop motion monster causing problems atop a famous landmark in New York City. It also could have had the iconic staying power of King Kong had it been released earlier. However, this came out in the 1980s, and by then all sorts of monster movies in the same vein had been released. Q is quite good for what it is, but I just don't know if there was a market for that kind of thing at the time. Personally, I can't get enough aerial shots of New York with stop motion dragons stitched in, especially when said dragon is willing to throw a goofy cop atop the Art Deco Peak. Beautiful. And lastly, number one, Belial from Basket Case. Somebody should get on a modern remake of this stat. I think it would be huge. Belial is a little misshapen puddle of a man. Actually, and I can't take credit for this thought, he looks like what would happen if Geodude had skin. Nice. 
This petulant little Pokemon spends most of his time in a wicker basket, thus the title, carried around by his twin brother Dwayne. At one point, Belial and Dwayne were conjoined twins, but were forced into being surgically removed from each other. This is a major trauma for both brothers, and as such, they traveled to New York years later to exact revenge on the doctors who performed the procedure. The story is of little consequence, because we all know why we're here. It's to watch this little blob with no legs jump five feet in the air and bite some people in the neck. The original basket case was shot super low budget, guerrilla style in New York City. The cast and crew ran around the busy streets waiting for opportunities to get the perfect shot. Belial was operated and voiced by the director himself in scenes where the puppet was used. Other scenes where Belial be moving around a little bit more were done in stop motion. The transitions between shots where he was a puppet and those where he's in stop motion are jarring and often hilarious. The cheese factor definitely played into his relative obscurity over the years, but Belial did get a sequel. In fact, he becomes the murderous protagonist in Basket Case 2. Good for him, taking his life into his own hands, being the star of his own story. You guys could uh, take some inspiration from him. But yeah, it's been a while since anyone has heard from him. So if you hear any ungodly screams coming from a wicker basket, please let me know. I miss him. How many of these weirdos do you remember? Is the time ripe for a reboot? Or should they remain as they are, comfortable in the cozy annals of horror history? Are there any forgotten monsters that I missed or forgot? Make sure to let me know down in the comments. Speaking of comments, let's take a look at some of your less forgettable ones from the top 5 scariest horror manga that you need to read. Part dos. Kitty Kitsune says, I played the werewolf game with the anime club at my school last year. Nobody actually died, don't worry. Sure they didn't. Everyone involved is definitely still alive. Adam Christopher says, Parasite could barely be considered, but I am surprised that Uzumaki didn't make the cut. Uh, Adam, why don't you go watch part one and get back to me, okay? Petitio Principi says, this channel has way more than five videos. Correct. Quite the astute observer we've got here, eh, folks? Michael McCulloch says, yo, the old school rip and dip Muhammad Ali shirt. I got the hoodie. Very classic. I was wondering if anyone would recognize it. And Devante Jarman says, I'm totally going to ruin my ability to sleep with this manga. I regret nothing. Read it now. You can sleep when you're dead. That's all the time we have for today. Before I go and play with uranium, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe for more monsters lost to time. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Now, although most of our favorite horror villains hail from Earth, including Mike Myers, Ghostface, Freddy to an extent, most on the other hand do not. Some hail from an alternate reality or dimension. So today on Top 5 Scary Videos, I'm going to be counting down our list of the top 5 scariest creatures from another dimension. Before we begin though, be sure to stick around until the end of the video where I'll be responding to some of your comments. And with that, let's jump in. Coming in at 5, Candyman. To quote the Candyman himself, they will say that I have shed innocent blood. What's blood for if not for shedding? Be my victim. Daniel Robert Daly, also known as the Candyman, is the main antagonist of the 1992 slasher film of the same name. He is also based off of the short story The Forbidden from the anthology book's Book of Blood, written by Clive Barker. Now, although he is a brutal killer with a vengeful spirit, Candyman had quite the tragic past compared to most horror movie villains, though saying that he is just as dangerous and just as deadly as any other horror movie icon. He is typically portrayed in the form of a lean and really tall African American a man around 6 foot 5 dwarfing over the film's protagonist. His attire consists of a large brown fur trench coat, a white cravat around his neck, grey pants, a pair of polished leather shoes and a bloody hook in the place of his right hand. Now, not too many of his powers have been displayed throughout the movies, but it is well known that he is immortal because he has been around for centuries. He has the ability to teleport at fast speeds as well as phasing through walls. He has superhuman strength and regenerative capabilities. He is also shown some form of telekinesis along with the ability to fly or levitate. The way to summon Candyman is by saying his name three times into a mirror, which is likely the last thing you'll do before you die. RIP. Coming in at number 4, The Babadook. To quote Mr. Babadook, if it's in the word or it's in a look, you can't get rid of the Babadook. Chilling. Mr. Babadook, or simply known as The Babadook, he is the main antagonist of the 2014 Australian horror movie of the same name. It most generally appears as a towering, shadowy boogeyman wearing a black coat and a hat, with long claw like hands and a pale, frightening face. It will haunt whomever reads its poem and hides inside a pop up book that mysteriously appears in a random home at any given time. The Babadook is considered to be the embodiment of grief. 
denial, anger, fear, bargaining, acceptance. Thanks to some brilliant special effects, the monster, aside from being a gay icon, has become one of the most beloved yet feared creatures in horror history. Now, when the book is read, it will summon Mr. Babadook to haunt and terrorize the victims. It appears to predict the actions that hosts of the Babadook will take. It seems to be of limited indestructibility. When torn apart, it reappeared taped together, but fails to return from being burnt. I personally have all of my fingers crossed for a sequel or a Babadook Pennywise crossover. Coming in at three, the Demogorgon. The Demogorgon, also known as the Monster, is the main antagonistic force in the TV show Stranger Things. It is a predatory humanoid creature that entered Hawkins, Indiana in November 1983. The creature originated from the parallel dimension known as the Upside Down, and when Eleven made interdimensional contact with it, a gate between dimensions opened up, releasing the Demogorgon. The Demogorgon is a tall and thin humanoid creature with elongated limbs. Its head lacks facial features, that is, until it unfurls the flesh like a flower to reveal petals lined with many sharp teeth and a large open mouth. The physical presence of the Demogorgon is often preceded by the creature's guttural growls and shrieks alongside all the lights in the area flickering on and off. The creature possesses several unique abilities including interdimensional travel, strength, telekinesis, blood detection, regenerative healing and durability. Now this creature passed through, terrorizing Hawkins for a week, abducting various residents in the process and taking them back to the upside down, usually killing them. Coming in at number 2, Pennywise. It, also commonly referred to as Pennywise, is an ancient alien slash eldritch monster and the title character of Stephen King's novel of the same name, It. Pennywise is a shape-shifting creature known as the Glamour who is billions of years old. Now although it did live on Earth for many years, Pennywise originated in a void slash dimension outside the regions of space known as the Macroverse. Its real name and species are called Deadlights, however few know this fact, which is why it is referred to as It or Pennywise. Pennywise. Its original form is that of a female spider and it lives deep below the fictional town of Derry, Maine. It has the ability to morph into any other person, animal or object. This gives Pennywise the ability to transform into a target's loved one or their worst psychological fear. However, like its name suggests, its favourite and most common form is that of a circus performer named Pennywise the Dancing Clown. Its real name is unknown, however in the novel it is referred to several times by the name Robert Bob Gray. This may actually be an allusion to real life child cannibal Albert Fish, who often referred to himself as Robert Gray. Now Pennywise's primary goal is to feed on humans, particularly children, because according to the creature children taste the best, not to mention frightened flesh tastes better and it uses uses fear to salt the meat. Love that. And finally coming in at number one, Cenobites. The Cenobites are extra dimensional beings who hail from the works of Clive Barker, including the Hellbound Heart and the nine Hellraiser movies. They can reach Earth's reality only through a schism in time and space, which is opened and closed using certain unearthly artifacts, the most common being a puzzle box, also known as the Lament Configuration. Now they vary in numbers, appearance and motivations depending on the medium they appear in. But to quote Clive Barker in the Hellbound Heart. When then was he so distressed to set eyes upon them? Was it the scars that covered every inch of their bodies? The flesh cosmetically punctured and sliced and infibulated, then dusted down with ash? Was it the smell of vanilla they brought with them, the sweetness of which did little to disguise the stench beneath? Or was it that as the light grew and he scanned them more closely, he saw nothing of joy or even humanity? In their maimed faces, only desperation and an appetite that made his bowels ache to be voided. All all of the Cenobites have horrific mutilations and wear fetishistic black leather clothing that often resembles religious vestments. These creatures escort their victims into a horrific dimension of eternal pain, which is utterly disturbing and depending on who you are and what you've done, they can offer either pleasure or pain, but mostly pain. The Cenobites dimension is depicted as a massive labyrinth resembling MC Ursha's relativity lithography with Leviathan levitating above its centre freaky stuff. Well there we have it, do you guys agree with our list? Were there any creatures that we missed? Leave us all your thoughts and feelings in the comments down below and perhaps we can do a part 2. Before I go though, I just want to respond to a few comments from one of our last videos. Top 5 scary SCP monsters that are actually good. Damien Staplecamp said, you have to love guys who tell women over the internet to show some skin. Her dad watches these. My dad does watch these and he'll tell me the comments. He always does. Vincent Maleb said, Please Lucy, the queen and mother of all SCP, free these children of yours. 
I'll do it when I decide. Not yet, but the time is coming. We're on the brink of war. <laughs> Benedict JJ said, are you also a friendly SCP? The furthest thing from it. <laughs> Bowsette said, that shoulder just got this vid demonetized. That vid was monetized, even though my shoulder was all the way out. Two shoulders next time. And on that note, if you haven't already, be sure to give this video a big thumbs up, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you never miss another scary vid. And until next time, see you later. MC Ursha's relax. MC Ursha's relativity. MC Ursha's relativity lith lithography. Lithography. The Cenobites dimension is depicted as a massive labyrinth resembling MC Ursha's relatively. MC Ursha's relativity lithography. <laughs> Gotta love some old school North Germanic mythology, right? There's nothing quite like a bunch of crazy powerful pagan gods and monsters living, fighting, freaking, and being fated to destroy the world. Plenty of popular stories today are based on the many characters that populate these ancient tales, and it's not hard to see why. It's just so cool, with so much potential for epic tales, trials, and triumphs. And what's a dashing hero without a terrifying beast to battle? And what's the fated end of the world without a bunch of final battles between monsters and men? I do love our little talks. Hey guys. Hello horror heads and welcome back to the scariest channel on YouTube, Top 5 Scary Videos. I'm your horror host Keegan Hughes and today we are counting down the top 5 scariest monsters from Norse mythology. Yeah, we are getting mythic. It's gonna be wicked. Before we get started, make sure to give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe for more Nordic nastiness. And I'm not referring to fermented fish. Outstanding. Let's get legendary. Kicking us off at number five, we've got the Draugr. What better place to start than with the classic national zombie variant? These are no simple shamble men though. Draugr are serious business. I love the possible origin for the word, a pale, ineffectual, and slow-minded person that drags himself along. Remind you of anyone? They live in their graves with many different goals depending on the situation. Some will just be guarding the treasure buried with them in their burial mound, which explains all the Draugr guarding underground treasure chests in Skyrim. Others just want to wreak general havoc, and some simply just want to torment those who cause them problems in life. I can relate. In terms of physical form, Draugr are animated corpses. Unlike other ghosts, these guys basically have all the same physical abilities that they did in life, plus more. Superhuman strength, shape shifting, and size changing abilities, and a wild amount of unexpected heaviness can make them formidable foes too. They can slay their victims in many ways, often crushing them with their enlarged forms like a thwomp, devouring their flesh, drinking their blood, and, of course, driving them mad. They're versatile. When this becomes too much of an issue, it takes a hero to wrestle them back into their graves. Conventional weapons don't have much of an effect on these rotten rapscallions, so they've got to be forced back underground and held there. And if you're not careful, they'll swim right back up through the rock. It's been said that rune stones can be implemented to keep them underground, but I prefer the decapitation and burning method. Whatever works, to be honest. Coming in at number four, Pesta. Like, Pestilence, right? I don't think that's the actual origin of the name, but if the shoe fits. Pesta is the personification of the plague in the form of an old woman in a black hood. Old ladies aren't too scary on their own, but with the knowledge that any old lady wearing black could end your life with terrible disease, that's horrifying. If you spot her while traveling, you'll know it's her. Pesta isn't malevolent or evil, she just sort of brings disease with her everywhere. And she's impossible to keep away, so don't bother. Keep an eye out though, if you do see her enter a town with a rake, some folks will die. If she rolls through with the broom, make your peace, no one's getting out alive. There's an old story of a ferryman who gave a ride to an old woman. As soon as she got on, he realized exactly who it was. The ferryman asked for his life to be spared, but to no avail. Pesta told him that he would die, but because he was kind enough to give her a ride, it would be an easy death. After he dropped her off, the ferryman went home exhausted, went to bed, and never woke up. There are worse fates, I suppose. Coming in at number three, Fenrir. Child of Loki, brother to Jormungand. This is a big wolf. The biggest wolf in Norse mythology, in fact. Prophecies foretold great trouble stemming from Fenrir and his rapid growth, so the gods raised him themselves to retain control. For a while, havoc was waylaid. However, Fenrir grew extremely fast. They tried to chain him up to keep him at bay, but the first two attempts were unsuccessful. The gods then convinced the giant wolf that the bindings were actually a game, a test of strength. Then the dwarves were commissioned to make a new rope, stronger than ever, with the appearance of being light and soft. 
Fenrir was suspicious of this chain though and would only agree to put it on if one of the gods put their hand in his mouth as a gesture of good faith. Tyr was brave enough to do so, knowing that his hand would soon be separate from his person. And thus, Fenrir was able to break free and Tyr was no longer able to play guitar. Tied to a boulder with a sword stuck in his mouth for ages, Fenrir had nothing to do but howl and drool, creating the frothy river expectation. At Ragnarok, he will break free and run through the world, upper jaw on the sky, lower jaw on the ground, and devour everything in his path. He'll also kill Odin before being killed by one of Odin's sons. I don't know about you, but I don't necessarily want to lay eyes upon a giant vacuum mouthed wolf eating everything and anything. Well, actually, scratch that. It's, if it's the last thing I'll see, I'm, I'm pretty down. Coming in at number two, we've got Jormungand. The giant snake living in the ocean surrounding Midgard. So large that it encompasses the entire world and then eats its own tail. Uruburos, baby! As I previously mentioned, it's the sibling of Fenrir, which is kind of odd considering one is a wolf and one is a snake, but hey, Loki like to get freaky. Jormungand is famous for having a wicked rivalry with Thor and engaging in many legendary battles with the hammer wielding thunder god. One of said tales has Thor fishing in the sea for the serpent. He snags it, starts pulling. As it gets closer to the surface, the giant Hymir becomes terrified. He sees Jormungand dribbling blood and poison and decides to cut the line, sending the snake back to the depths. Thor was not happy about this development. He got his rematch later on though, of course, when the two met during Ragnarok. One telltale sign that Ragnarok is coming is the violent unrest of the seas. This happens because our slippery pal here has released his tail from his mouth and begins to thrash around and then flop on land. Once this happens, it will spit poison to fill half the earth. The snake and the god do battle with Thor emerging victorious, but then succumbing to poison. Lose lose fellas, that's not the way we wanted this to go. Another fun fact about the gigantic serpent is that continental Germans used to attribute earthquakes to his movements, which is especially terrifying in context. Imagine you're a German peasant and an earthquake rolls through. Your house? Rubble. Your wife? Pancaked. Your crops? Shaken, not stirred. And what explanation do you have? Oh, it's a snake bigger than anything you could ever imagine? Cool, good to know that's just slithering around beneath us and can surface at any moment. I definitely won't live the rest of my life in crippling fear. And finally at number one, Cert. In the beginning, there was only the blackness of Ginnungagap. Then Cert appeared out of the darkness with his flaming sword and touched land. It lit up and became the land of fire. Eventually it came close enough to Niflheim, the realm of ice. This contact warmed and melted the frozen earth, revealing Ymir, the primal frost giant, along with the great cow. And thus life was created with the meeting of ice and fire. Just wait though, because like any good parent will tell you, I brought you into this world and I can take you out. Ah, memories. Surt is a fire giant who played a part in creating life and also shows up during Ragnarok to do two things. No, not kick ass and chew bubblegum. He's fated to kill the god Freyr and be slain by him in return. This and destroy the world with his flaming sword. Yeah, it's pretty terrifying. A massively destructive parental figure with a fire blade. He's not mad, he's just disappointed. Yeah, those are some wicked scary Norse monsters and mayhem causers. When Ragnarok comes, I don't even know which side to take. Probably not the Draugr. Other than that, it's up in the air. Well, maybe the Draugr. What do you think of the list? Any mythic monsters I missed? Make sure you let me know down in the comments. Speaking of comments, let's take a look at some of your more ironclad ones from top five scariest SCP monsters that managed to escape. Part three, Jason Podell says series six launched, yes! Hell yeah, brother. Now go and read some hot and spicy new SCP entries while there are still some mysteries to solve. Kazuma Kun says the winner of the ultimate showdown should be SCP Infinity, aka Mr. Rogers in a bloodstained sweater. So, are you saying it's the ultimate showdown of SCP Infinity? Yikes. Undead says I have a question. I'm a CIP, means I can't feel pain. Do I also classify as an SCP? You're gonna have to take that up with the research division. Maybe an MTF will swing by and let you know. The Dorkster King says if this gets shouted out, I am gonna. There's no reason for this, too, but. Yeah. Yep. You're gonna what? What are you gonna do? And James Vance says, if part of your job is to contain something, then how the hell did these critters get out? It's kinda like asking the police why crimes still happen if they're patrolling the streets, or asking a bank how identity thefts are still going on despite modern security. If an SCP wants out, it's gonna do everything in its power to get out. 
And that's all the time we have for today. Before I bite down on my cyanide tooth, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe for more storied snakes and sword wielders. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. <gasps> Corpses with a corpor with a corporeal. What? Bro, what am I writing these days? Adumla. 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 Along with a dumpla. <laughs> I sound like an idiot saying that. It's gonna be so wrong too. Cert is a giant fire giant. Giant fire giant. We all have our favorite iconic horror movie villain, from Michael Myers to Freddy Krueger to Jason Voorhees. We love to fear them, and we love to root for them in some cases. However, some of our favorite villains have backstories we were totally unaware of. Backstories that make their lives seem rather bleak and tragic, in turn making us sympathize with them instead of fear them. So today on Top 5 Scary Videos, I'm going to be counting down our list of the Top 5 Horror Movie Monsters with Depressing Backstories. Before we begin though, be sure to stick around until the end of the video where I'll be responding to some of your comments. And with that, let's jump in. Coming in at number 5, Candyman. Daniel Robertelli, also known as Candyman, is the titular main antagonist of the 1992 slasher horror film of the same name and its sequels, based off of the short story by Clive Barker. Now Candyman's origins are explored in a legend surrounding the tragic death of a painter in the city of Chicago during the early 1800s, the story itself appearing in 1890. The legend told that Candyman was initially the son of a slave, who became extremely wealthy after inventing a machine which mass produced shoes during the American Civil War. With his newfound fortune, the father sent his boy to one of the best schools in America. He grew up to become a polite and good natured gentleman, as well as a well known painter, most famous for capturing a person's status in portraits. Sometime around 1890, the young painter had been commissioned by a wealthy landowner to capture the beauty of his daughter, a white virgin. The painter's only sin was falling for the girl with whom they were to have a child out of wedlock. Unfortunately, the girl's father had discovered their relation and was left so outraged that he hired a lynch mob to find and kill the young painter. As the mob chased him down the streets of the near north end of Chicago, they eventually overpowered him and sawed off his right hand with a rusty blade. His body was then smeared with honey, causing the bees to sting him to death and prompting the future generations of the neighborhood to christen him Candyman. Coming in at number 4, Frankenstein's Monster. Frankenstein's monster, often referred to as Frankenstein, is a fictional character who first appeared in Mary Shelley's 1818 novel Frankenstein. In the story, Victor Frankenstein builds the creature in his laboratory through an ambiguous method consisting of chemistry and alchemy. The monster is described as 8 foot tall and hideously ugly, but sensitive and emotional. It attempts to fit into human society but is ultimately shunned, which leads him to seek revenge against Frankenstein. As depicted by Shelley, the monster is a sensitive emotional creature whose only aim is to share his life with another sentient being like himself. From the very beginning he is rejected by everyone he meets and realizes from the moment of his birth that even his own creator cannot stand the sight of him. This is obvious when Frankenstein says, one hand was stretched out seemingly to detain me but I escaped. Now upon seeing his own reflection he realizes that he too was repulsed by his appearance. His greatest desire though is to find love and acceptance but when the desire is denied, he swears revenge on his creator. Now, more interesting still, there is a deeper meaning to the monster when you look closely. The monster has been analogized to an oppressed class. Shelley wrote that the monster recognized the division of property, of immense wealth, and squalid poverty. Whereas others see the monster as a tragic result of uncontrolled scientific progress. Either way, his story is absolutely tragic. Coming in at number three, The Phantom of the Opera. Eric, also known as The Phantom of the Opera, is the title character from Gaston Leroux's novel Le Phantom de l'Opera. In the original novel, few details are given regarding Eric's past. It does, however, confirm that Eric has traveled to multiple countries, including France, Russia, Persia, and northern Vietnam, learning various arts and sciences along the way. Eric himself laments the fact that his mother was absolutely horrified by his birth deformity and that his father, a trust master mason, never saw him. Most of Eric's history is actually revealed by a mysterious figure known throughout most of the novel as 
as the Persian or the Daroga, who saved Eric's life in Persia and followed him to Paris. In the original novel, Eric is described as corpse like and is referred to as having a death's head throughout the story. He has no nose, eyes that are sunken so deep that all that is seen are two skull like sockets, except when his golden eyes glow in the dark, skin that is yellow and tightly stretched across his bones, and only a few wisps of ink black hair behind his ears and on his forehead. He is described as extremely thin, so much so that he resembles a skeleton. Christine graphically describes his cold, bony hands, which also smell of death. Eric sometimes even plays up his macabre appearance, such as sleeping in a coffin and dressing up as the Red Death for the masked ball. However, we can't help the way we look. That is sad. Coming in at number two, Carrie White. Carrietta N. White, best known as Carrie White, is the titular main protagonist from Stephen King's first horror novel, Carrie, published back in 1974. She is the only daughter of Margaret and Ralph White, although it is hinted to that Ralph may have had other children with different women. For all of her childhood and misunderstood teenage life, Carrie, whose father abandoned his family and later died in a construction accident, was disciplined for being taken by curses and secretly abused and beaten into submission and mistreated by her mentally ill, religiously fanatical mother for everything on a daily basis. Later, Carrie was incessantly picked on and mistreated by her classmates because of her differences, and was of course at the bottom of the social hierarchy, with no one knowing, not even her mother, that Carrie possessed extraordinary powers. These powers would come forth during high school, after she had her first period in the girls' locker room. This in turn would cause a chain reaction, and not just to Carrie's demise, but hundreds of other students. As we all know when a so called prank at a senior prom occurs, which saw kids pouring pig's blood on Carrie, she finally snapped, lost her sanity, and used her abilities to take revenge on her bullies. She ultimately kills everyone before returning home and killing her homicidal mother as well. In the end, an entire town was destroyed, with Carrie taking the lives of around 440 lives. Moral of the story don't bully people. And finally, coming in at number one, Jason Voorhees. To quote the narrator of Friday the 13th, there's a legend around here. A killer buried but not dead, a curse on Crystal Lake, a death curse, Jason Voorhees curse. They say he died a boy but he keeps coming back. Few have seen him and lived, some have even tried to stop him. No one can. People forget he's down there, waiting. Now, Jason is of course the main antagonist and centerpiece of the Friday the 13th franchise. He was an almost silent, undead, and seemingly unstoppable killing machine. Jason is an iconic madman who haunts Camp Crystal Lake and the surrounding area, driven to slaughter anyone he encounters to avenge the death of his beloved mother Pamela. As of right now, Jason has killed around 161 people over the years. However, However, that stat aside, he has a devastating backstory. Jason was born in the small town of Crystal Lake on June 13, 1946, to Elias and Pamela Voorhees. He was afflicted with severe facial deformities, hydrocephalus, an abnormally large head, and mental disabilities. Raising Jason on her own, Pamela kept her son isolated from the community, not letting him attend school and educating him in their home. This would lead Jason to admire his mother, following through on all her commands, and that's one of the reasons why his mother's ghost gives him commands. In the summer of 1957, Pamela brought Jason with her to Camp Crystal Lake, where she worked as a cook. He was bullied almost instantly by the other campers, with Jason attempting to escape his tormentors. However, the cruel children caught up with him on the dock and threw him into the lake where he ultimately drowned. Even though his body was never found, the camp closed as a result before reopening the following summer. Well, there we have it. Do you guys agree with our list? Were there any horror movie monsters that we missed? Leave us all your thoughts and feelings in the comments down below and perhaps we can do a part two. Before I go though, I just want to respond to a few comments from one of our last videos. Top five worst horror movies of the decade you should never watch. Jessica Thill said, the only good thing about the Bye Bye Man was Carrie Ann Moss. I agree and disagree. Not even Carrie Ann could save that film, but I do love her. I went through a deep obsession with her once. I've seen every movie. Quiz me. Mateus Markusik said, I would love to have some conversations with Lucy. I like talking. We can talk together if you want, <laughs> if that interests you. <laughs> Kathy Papa said, Wow, thanks. I was thinking about watching Smiley. No more though. I don't even know why you would think about watching Smiley. It looked atrocious. Creepy at the Disco to Battle said, I didn't know Shane Dawson was in a movie. I'm shook. I didn't know he was in a movie either until I did the research to that list. And I'm also shook. And on that note, if you haven't already, be sure to give this video a big thumbs up, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you never miss another scary vid. And until next time, see you later.